coming up. The miracle bridge that can be built in minutes. Incredible pens that just won't wash. And the electric motorbike that leaves gas guzzlers for dead. How do they do it? Mosul, Iraq, shortly after the 2003 invasion. As so often in war, the first casualties are the bridges. Bridges have huge strategic importance. The legendary Chinese general Sun Tzu declared in the art of war that when your army has crossed the border, you should burn your boats and bridges. The idea was to make sure everybody knew you had no intention of going home again. Rebuilding in a war zone isn't an option. The solution? A tactical military bridge that can be assembled in 90 minutes. How do they do it? Fairy Aviation in Stockport, England once built planes for the RAF and the Royal Navy. These days, they're known as WFEL Limited, but they're still in the business of military hardware. Some of it is a bit smaller than the rest. This is a scale model of the dry support bridge. These mobile marvels are transportable by road, up to 46 metres long and strong enough to carry a tank. A real one. Military bridges that could be constructed quickly are nothing new. The first were pontoon bridges that floated on water. Alexander the Great made one by stuffing his soldiers' tents with straw to make a series of rafts. I hope you checked that they weren't still in them. The bridges the guys build here are basically giant quick-build Meccano kits. For transportation, they must be light. But to support jeeps, armoured vehicles and battle tanks, they must be super strong. The secret is to build the bridge kits from military-grade aluminium alloy. As strong as steel, but a third of the weight. The challenge for the factory is transforming the bits of aluminium into six-metre-long interlocking bridge sections. Each made up of two giant girders with a roadway on top. A girder is the support beam that holds the bridge up. Girder bridges are the most simple and common type of bridge in the whole world. At its basic level, a girder bridge is just a log across a creek. The first stage is to build each girder. The thing is, they need to make them strong enough to carry up to 120 tonnes. To start, they clamp alloy strips into something called a picture frame. Then they weld them carefully together. This forms the frame of the girder, which gives it its strength. It's vital the welds don't fail in a war zone. To check they're up to the job, they X-ray them. The scientist who discovered X-rays won the very first Nobel Prize, but he refused to patent his discovery because he wanted the whole of humankind to benefit. Wilhelm Röntgen, the discoverer of X-rays, probably never imagined they'd be used on bridges. Once the X-ray image has been taken, it's over to Chief Radiologist Alan Booth. All we have to do now is take the film off. And that needs processing now. In the darkroom, Alan scrutinises the X-rays like an orthopaedic surgeon checking for invisible fractures. These welds are very clean, of a very high standard. Once Alan's happy with the frame... ..the girders are assembled by a team of welders... ..who add panels of heat-treated aluminium to form the sides... ..and an aluminium track to the top. There could be as many as 16 panels in a bridge. The next challenge is to ensure they're easy to bolt together, but not so easy to pull apart. 
The answer is something called the jaw, a monster bracket that connects each segment of the bridge and locks them together. The jaws come under more strain than any other part of the structure. To handle the weight of the bridge and the vehicles that cross it, jaws are made from precisely engineered, high-strength stainless steel. The trick now is to turn these lumps of metal into these precision-engineered jaws. For that, they turn to a computer-controlled mill with more vicious drills than a dentist. Inside the machine, 90 liquid-cooled drills bore into the metal, creating holes for pins and screws, vital to the bridge's assembly. Then a space-age probe ensures the holes are precise to within a thousandth of a millimetre. One of the most famous quick assembly bridges was designed by British civil servant Donald Bailey for use in World War II. Eisenhower said it was one of the three most important bits of kit that won the war in Europe, along with radar and the heavy bomber. The next problem is these giant construction kits must survive everything from harsh desert sandstorms to brutal salt waters. Bare metal could corrode with potentially catastrophic results. The solution is a relentless bombardment in the paint room. The pieces are grit blasted, primed, spray painted, and then baked in an oven, where they cure a rich camouflage greeny brown. Modern camouflage started in 1915 when the French army realized that their white gloves and red pantaloons made them an easy target. I mean, come on, you could see these guys from a mile away. So they went about creating something a little bit stealthier, wouldn't make them stick out so much. The next problem is the painted bridge could be slippery when wet, a recipe for disaster in a war zone. The solution, a special non-slip layer containing small pieces of grit to keep boots and tires on the bridge and not in the drink. Even the quality of the paint finish isn't left to chance. In the lab, Colin Murphy cooks a painted sample in a hot salt bath for two weeks. What we've put in here today has been placed in an environment that's more extreme than anything the bridge will encounter in the field. With the bridge sections complete, there's just one thing left to do. Just like Meccano, every new bridge section the company makes is designed to fit together with any one of the hundreds of identical bridge systems that they've built in the last 40 years. To ensure this latest section matches up, they test it on this master gauge. Success! It fits like a four-ton glove. And another bridge section is complete. All the parts will be loaded onto a specially adapted lorry, ready to be deployed to disaster areas and war zones anywhere in the world. And this is how it works in the field in Iraq. Trucked in, it takes just eight men 90 minutes to bridge this 44-metre-wide river. A launch beam extends like a giant fishing rod to the opposite bank. One by one, the bridge sections are suspended from this beam. The sections are connected using the interlocking jaws and then slid out across the gap, creating a 46-metre roadway in less time than it takes to play a football match. Precision engineering meets military precision. Still to come, the pen that makes its mark permanently and the world's fastest production motorcycle. Over 200 without a drop of gas. How do they do it? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. The pen is mightier than the sword. And this one is mightier than the washing machine. The permanent marker is the weapon of choice for everyone from fabric designers to infant prodigies. 
anything marked with one of these stays marked. How do they do it? Germans don't say marker pens. They say edding. Here in Bautzen, Germany, in a factory the size of two football pitches, the Edding brand produces 85 million markers a year. And chief scribe Jörg Thomas Schimkus is ready to lift the lid on the whole operation. Today we are making a green highlighter and a blue permanent textile pen. First, they have to produce the pen barrels, and they're made from tiny plastic beads called granulates which arrive in not-so-tiny tankers. This one carries enough to make two million markers. A river of beads is pumped into giant silos that hold 30 tonnes each. The first pens came from ancient Egypt. They used reed straws and then cut in a split nib. Today, it's a bit more sophisticated. Tina Glausch is making blue fabric markers. To give the barrels their distinctive hue, she adds one gram of blue colouring to every 49 grams of white granulate. Then she pops the kettle on. This orange container mixes the different coloured beads and feeds them into the superheated injection moulding machine, which melts them at 230 degrees C. Then a stainless steel mould thrusts in with a force of 180 tonnes. Cold water is piped in to cool the plastic, and out come 32 pen barrels every 17 seconds. The barrels arrive with other plastic components at the assembly line. Trouble is, they're a disorganised mob. So this machine orders them into single file and marches them down the line. You can't write with an empty tube. So white plastic cylinders are loaded into each barrel and then filled with ink. But this isn't any old ink. It's waterproof, heatproof and never fades. Back in the Middle Ages, ink contained lamp black, eggs, urine and poisons such as lead, arsenic and mercury. Modern inks, in contrast, are the product of complex chemistry. A mixture of man-made dyes, solvents, wetting and binding agents. Next, the machine squeezes plugs onto the bottom of the pens before an ultrasonic welder seals the deal. 333 vibrations per second heat the plastic so plug and barrel mould together. Finally, the markers get labels and a tip-top finish. Rounded acrylic nibs to write with. And plastic tops to stop them drying out. Which are nudged into place. Then the pens are boxed up at a rate of a thousand a minute. In 2014, kids in an Australian primary school made it to the Guinness Book of Records by creating the longest ever chain of marker pens. They used 7,210. But what if you want something less permanent and more fluorescent? A highlighter, for example, with glowing ink. That calls for a remarkable secret ingredient. Sugar. Yes. Incredible as it seems, the same stuff you sprinkle on your cereal makes fluorescent ink glow. Sugar has all sorts of strange uses, from treating bee stings to curing hiccups to soothing a burnt tongue. You can even use it to get rid of grass stains. Dressed in bio-warfare chic to guard against inhaling dangerous solvents, Gerd William adds yellow and blue dye to the mix. As any child knows, yellow and blue makes green. But when there's a chemical reaction with sugar, something magical happens. It glows. Making fluorescent pens is much the same as markers. So, we're just showing the highlights. Barrels. Cylinders. 
chisel-shaped nibs to draw the perfect line. And a dose of sweet, sugary fluorescent ink. One pen born every second. They don't have time to check every batch. So it's over to the robo-writer-in-residence. He's no Shakespeare, but the machine does ensure pens write evenly and clearly without drying up. For a specific but secret amount of time. Given the fluorescent green light, they're ready to go to a school, office or factory near you. Electric vehicles. Slow, safe and a little bit pedestrian. Wrong! <laughs> this is the fastest motorcycle you can buy. It can do 350 kilometres an hour. That's faster than NASCAR. And incredibly, this two-wheeled lightning bolt is totally electric. How do they do it? San Carlos, California. At Lightning Motorcycles, they're building the next generation of Superbike. When it went on sale, the LS218 became the fastest motorbike you can buy. Quicker than any petrol-powered monster from the big names of the industry. It's the battery-operated brainchild of engineer Richard Hatfield. The LS218 set a land speed record at Bonneville, two-way average of 215.96 miles an hour. 215 was the average speed over two runs. On its fastest run, this baby clocked a speed of 218 miles an hour. This makes it not only the fastest electric bike, but the fastest production bike, period. The secret to the superbike speed is its simplicity. By keeping things very simple, it allows more of the power that's made to get to the rear wheel for acceleration. Uh, it allows the bike to be lighter, to be more efficient and more powerful. In the machine shop, engineer Chris is building the latest incarnation of the electric motor. Inside a cast aluminium housing called the Stator, a whirling rotor will turn at 10,000 revolutions per minute. That spinning motion turns the chain, which transmits up to 200 horsepower straight to the rear wheel. The problem with combustion engines is that they have hundreds of moving parts, which over time stop working or wear out altogether. With an electric motor, there's only one moving part, the rotor. And this remarkable electric motor has another trick up its precision-engineered sleeve. When you want to slow down on a normal bike, you apply the brakes. Brake pads press against the wheels, converting the bike's motion into thermal energy, or heat. The bike slows down. The energy is lost. But this bike works differently. When you release the throttle, the motor stops driving the rear wheel, and the wheel starts turning the motor. This transforms the motor into a generator, and the electricity it produces recharges the battery. You only need the brakes in an emergency. In the same way a combustion engine needs a supply of gas, an electric motor needs a store of electricity. Engineer David Fitzrandolph builds the bike's battery system. On a single 30-minute charge, this 20-kilowatt battery stack can drive the superbike for up to 290 kilometres. I'm building a very big gas tank. This is effectively the fuel for the bike. This is what makes it move. So batteries work by harnessing the energy from certain chemical reactions, and the technology could well be ancient. Scientists have found what they think is a battery that's over 2,000 years old. It's made up of iron and copper in a clay jar. Imagine putting two of those in the back of your remote, eh? With its electric motor and cutting-edge battery, the bike has incredible power. The key to its incredible speed is keeping the weight down. This machine weighs 225 kilos. 
close to half the weight of a classic touring bike. CNC machines cut the frame and swing arm from blocks of strong, light aluminium, while the fairing and body parts are made from tough but lightweight carbon fibre. Multiple sheets are layered together, then cured in the oven for two to four hours at 140 degrees. When they emerge, they've hardened into shape. With battery and motor installed, they fit the body shell on top and attach special lightweight forged magnesium wheels and the tyres. All that's missing is the transmission or gearbox. And there's a good reason for that. There isn't one. The transmission transfers the energy of the engine to the bike's rear wheel by a series of cogs. This makes sure the wheel is given the right amount of torque or twisting force. The problem is, every time energy is transferred from one cog to the other, some of it is lost. A bike can lose as much as 15% of its power in this way. The other problem with normal engines is that they only generate maximum torque when they're turning over at several thousand RPM. But with this electric bike, the torque generated is almost constant, regardless of the motor's speed. With an electric motor, we have a very flat torque band. So from virtually zero RPMs to almost redline, the torque is very even and very high. So, you know, we don't need a transmission. This setup allowed the Lightning Superbike to set a land speed record and to win the prestigious Pikes Peak Hill Climb, a 20 kilometer challenge known as the Race to the Clouds. It left combustion bikes to eat dust. So when people say something is as fast as lightning, they mean this bike.